Well, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community and in particular the Stony Creek Nation who are the traditional and original owners and continuing custodians of this land where we meet today and to their elders past, present and emerging. So we're here to hear from uh, Dr Trevor Lampkin. Just very quick, because you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to Trevor, but a little bit of an intro. His passion for butterflies began in his teens and uh, he went on to formalise that through study. He holds a PhD from the University of Queensland uh, that he gained in 2011 and just in September he finished his Masters. Uh, he basically has turned his hobby into his job. He's previously been an entomologist with the Queensland Department of Primary Industries where he worked on the management of pest species. And he's also an editor with the uh, journal Australian Entomologist. I'd like to digress and just mention uh, the other donor that can't be with us. Unfortunately, Ian Knight passed away earlier this year. We were very uh, fortunate to have Ian join us in the collections uh, pre-COVID. Uh, it was obvious that his passion for his hobby uh, was there and he passed some of that on to us. Uh, and of course, his wife, Cindy. Welcome, Cindy, thank you for coming along. Just a little bit about the collection. We think it's 16,000 butterflies strong. <laughs> Trevor's, if Trevor's not sure, we're not sure. We do know that uh, Ian and Trevor collected uh, across Australia, uh, particularly uh, along uh, up and down the eastern seaboard. Uh, there's also specimens from Oceania, Southeast Asia, America, Sicily, yeah, Europe. everywhere, Europe. Uh, like any true uh, collector, he collected wherever he went. We know that it includes extinct and rare species and probably undescribed species. Uh, and it also comes with bonus material like a whole lot of beetles. Trevor's uh, delivering it to us in uh, different, uh, a, a number of instalments. Uh, we think we've received what we will call, say, the second instalment, which was around 5,400 insects and spiders. That came down in the last month, as well as what Trevor managed to bring in as hand luggage. Uh, imagine the sniffer dog. <laughs> so, and uh, then, so we as the museum need to put some nominal value on that. And we call it the recollection value. So that, just that instalment's worth over $1.5 million. That doesn't actually reflect the true recollection value. Uh, but it's all we can do for accounting purposes. The true value really is in its research potential. Already Trevor's uh, published 37 papers on the collection and there are many more to come. I'd like to thank the donors to our Butterfly Appeal, both institutional and individuals. I know there's some here. Thank you very much. It's, uh, we've received this uh, nationally significant collection, but we do need to uh, uh, raise funds to house that collection. On that note, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr Trevor Lampkin to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I've, uh, before I start the talk, I just want to, um, a few thank yous must be said. Number one, I, I owe a, a lot of gratitude to uh, my um, comrade over many, many years, Ian Knight. Uh, he was um, both supportive and a good knowledge base and uh, you, always, uh, you always receive some down-to-earth advice from him. So he was a very good friend over those 40-something years that I knew him. Uh, and uh, it can't be the better halves of the Lampkin Knight collection. Uh, Cindy Knight and Tina Lampkin have to be congratulated as well because they either by uh, patience or encouragement or a bit of both they've uh, th they've got us through to this point where we can donate this uh, quite extensive collection to QV mag 
And of course, um, David, uh, David Maynard's done a lot of hard work, Simon Fern, in getting this together. And I, I appreciate an Ian, um, uh, the late Ian uh, would be uh, ecstatic that um, we knew about that it was going to a good home. And I'm convinced that the home it's going to will be good, well looked after, and well studied in the, in the decades and years to come. So look, let's jump into it. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, the collection as a, um, as a whole. And so the, uh, uh, it's uh, entitled East Coast and Beyond because uh, Ian and myself uh, did not actually collect butterflies west of Darwin. Uh, we received some material from there, but our main concentration, it, we were collecting together while Ian lived in Brisbane. He lived in Brisbane up until about 1996, and then he retired, as, you know, I think it was retirement, in about, 19, about that year he came to Delarena in the Meander Valley, and he retired there, and then from that point on he more or less concentrated on uh, Victor, um, sorry, Tasmanian butterflies, and of course he used to do the long annual treks to the Torres Strait. I then concentrated mainly on the tropical areas, the wet tropics, uh, uh, Mossman to Ingham, and I did the continue the work in the Torres Strait as well. So that's where the, the sort of epicenters of of the collection ended up being being made. But but in the but up to that point. Uh, we did uh, collect extensively all along the east coast from uh, Bamaga in the very far north of Australia down to Victoria. So, now what, what I'm going to address in this presentation is uh, why we actually make collections of natural history specimens. You know, wh why do people do it? Wh why do we do it? What's the benefits? Um, what what is it that uh, strangely makes an insect so easy to preserve? Why, why is it so? Why, are, why don't they just rot away like uh, other animals and plants do? And uh, I'll give a very brief overview of the history of butterfly collecting. Uh, that's uh, history as in across the world, where it started and uh, who were the great early people of that era and the history of the Lampkin Knight collection, uh, how it started. Talk about its composition, how many are in each group, what, what the groups are. And as David mentioned, I'll elaborate on the benefits, the benefits of having, having an, uh, an insect or slash butterfly collection. What are the benefits? So. why we make collections of natural history specimens. That's, um, that photograph there is in, um, in Sicily in 2010. That's my grandson there, Alexander, when he was eight years of age. At that stage, he was very interested in, in butterfly collecting. He later turned to beetle collecting and frogs and reptiles, so he's done... Um, but he was very interested in natural history. So you would look at some of the drawers over there and, and each, um, uh, each one of those butterflies tells us a story about their, their living relatives that are still hopefully still alive. So out of, the, out of what's sitting in a drawer we can, we can gain a lot of information about distributions, temporal data, when they're there, when they're not there, where they were once, where they're not now, all that sort of thing we can get from those specimens sitting in those drawers. Okay, um, so they're, as it says here, they're, they're, they're important for, um, uh, for basically monitoring and documenting biodiversity. But in addition, a collection should not be, be um, downed uh, as in there seems to be a there seems to be a, a current mode with people in general where butterfly collectors are looked down on, but in reality, what 
the butterfly collectors have done over the years has been the best form of conservation. Now, at this point, I'm going to just digress slightly to conservation. Uh, and it might seem inappropriate to suggest that butterfly collections uh, should be encouraged. Butterfly collecting should be encouraged. But they really, they really should be. Uh, it is definitely a conservation measure. If we did not have, if we did not have collections such as what is going to QV Mag, we wouldn't know anything about butterflies or we wouldn't know anything about insects in general. We would know very, very little about them. And since they're the largest animal group of all animal groups on, the, on, on Earth, um, it's probably wise to know about them. Uh, and, of course, it fosters an appreciation of beauty of these creatures. And, uh, the, um, and the beauty, uh, and as I alluded to, the understanding of these creatures and what we know about them comes from collecting them. And then from young collectors, entomologists are born. All entomologists, I, you know, most of them at some stage started by collecting butterflies, had an appreciation of uh, butterflies, their beauty, and wanted to somehow get close to them. So, and I'll, as I alluded to before, almost all our knowledge of invertebrates are from collections. Otherwise, if we didn't make collections, we, we would be very, very, very <laughs> poorly, they would be very poorly understood. So, uh, basically, why are they easy to collect? Uh, I think the closest analogy of an insect is someone in a, in an, in a suit of armour. Uh, when, the, when the insect dies, its armour stays on intact. And it it basically, they're, they're different to us. We have an internal skeleton, they have an outer, external skeleton. Uh, we, we go down to our, our bones. They die inside, basically, but the outer structure is left there. So they're, they're strangely, um, whether it's a... Um, a gift of the creator or what, but strangely, they're designed, they seem to be designed to be able to do that. We see, and because they're designed to, to actually preserve well, uh, they're, they're fantastic organisms to preserve and study. Yeah, so they, and this, this, um, the, this external skeleton they have can last for, endure for, if it's kept in the right environment, can endure for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they basically still look the same. So, yeah, basically insects are different. Um, they're different to mammals and marsupials, birds. Uh, they're, they're very short-lived. They, uh, they have... Um, most, most butterflies, most butterflies probably only live a fortnight, two weeks. Some go on longer, some live six months, some even might live 12 months. The famous monarch butterflies of North America, they live for 12 months. But most butterflies rapidly go through as uh, the immature stages. Only, uh, well, they, down in Tasmania here it's a different story. The butterflies develop slowly through winter and then then pick up in spring and then emerge in summer and they're probably, most species are only out for a fortnight. Uh, so you've got to remember too that, that of all the insects that uh, every, and particularly butterflies, every, every butterfly that you see flying around, uh, that is, that's really only about 2%, 1 to 2% of the number of eggs that the mother laid. So they, li they li lose somewhere between uh, 98 to 99 percent of progeny are lost from egg to adult in various stages, due to spiders, parasitoids, predators. So the highest mortality is uh, is in uh, the the young stage when the when the uh, after the egg is hatched and the small larva emerges. Uh, predation by spiders is very, very high. 
we have a lot of spiders. So now if you, get, if you look at that roughly, uh, there, there's a figure there that there's actually roughly uh, every average acre of wooded, um, wooded uh, land has roughly, roughly got about two million spiders per hectare of land. So if you consider that uh, there's that many spiders out there, they all need to eat something. <laughs> and, uh, and, and butterfly larvae are a, a good prey for them. So, so worry, you know, if we worry about um, every butterfly that a butterfly, that a butterfly collector might collect, it's really negligible compared with what spiders do. So, <laughs> so down on those spiders. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, and, but it, we need all that to happen to make the world go round. It, it's, our world exists because of those, those very, those, that sort of data. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> so we're back to collecting specimens now and comparing it to, say, a, a, a cleared hectare of forest. Uh, what, the, what the butterfly collector might do is absolutely um, negligible compared with what a, a bulldozer can do uh, on, a, on a hectare of forest. And, um, and the many, many butterfly collectors, and most butterfly collectors, in fact, uh, they don't even collect the adult butterflies, they actually collect the immature stages and rear them through to the adult stage where they get a, a perfect specimen. And if you consider that 98% of, of the juvenile stages are lost to predators, they're actually getting material through for their collection that would never make it in the real world. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're a pretty sensible lot. Yeah, it says butterfly collectors are a sensible lot. And they don't, don't take too many, and, um, eh, and they only take basically, and they release what, what they're not, what's not needed. Or they give them to other collectors who don't have that one. So, you know, they spread that around. Okay, when did it all start? Now, this is, um, this is a grey area, and we, we don't really know when the interest in butterfly collecting started. But the first Royal Society was, uh, uh, was found in England in 1562 and that's when, uh, you know, the, the learned, learned gentlemen used to get, uh, get in smoking houses and have a cigar and, and talk about their adventures and what insects they collected. And it was really that environment, that learned sort of environment that started off butterfly collecting. And, uh, then Caroli Linnae, or commonly known as Linnaeus, uh, when, when his name was Latinized, he actually, st uh, he actually commenced the, the binomial system of, of, a, of naming animals, as in um, we are Homo sapiens, two names, butterflies have two names, a generic name, which is the first name, and a species name, which is the second one. So he, he, actually, um, he actually did that in, in a, a publication called Systema Naturae and it was published in 1758. So uh, now from that point on then, what they did was they tried to name as many animals and plants as they could using this new, new binomial system of, of naming. And to this very day, um, that system that was developed by Linnaeus works quite well. It's amazing how species do fit into those categories. So that, um, and one of his students was a fellow by the name of Fabricius and he named a lot of the material that came back from the 1770 uh, discovery voyage of Captain Cook where they landed at Botany Bay and then they landed at several places up the east coast, finally being shipwrecked at Cooktown, of course. While they were shipwrecked at Cooktown, they collected quite a number of species of tropical North Queensland butterflies, and all those specimens are still in the Natural History Museum in England. So they're still there. Now, so we'll go back to some butterfly specimens now. Now, the top, the top one is... is um, Pontia Dapovedici, it's, uh, it's, it's called the Bath White. It was first discovered at a town called Bath in England. And that, they think, is the earliest, uh, earliest known, that's the earliest existing specimen 
1702, uh, they think, or it might have even been a little bit earlier, they think they can't really pinpoint what year it was. But it's still in the, uh, the Oxford University Museum. So it's, um, it's getting on now in years. So, you know, how many years, you know? You know, so it's you know it's in excess of 400 years old, and that's the that's the top one. It's still still sitting there with the label underneath it, uh, which we'll go into soon. But you know, they do if you look after them, they're they're very very good, um, very very good little pieces of history and pieces of information. Now the second one, um, they believe that this was actually the first butterfly collected in Australia. It was collected just north of 1770 in, uh, in, on the 29th of May. At, well, it was collected just north of the place called 1770 at, on the 29th of May 1770 by Joseph Banks. And he took that back to, um, he took that back to England and um, Fabricius then gave it the name Hamata and that name still exists. So the species name Hamata. So it's, in, it's actually in extraordinary condition for its age. So excess of 250, something like that, about 250 years. Yeah. Right, so how do we get these butterflies? You know, do we just sort of walk along and they fly into our drawers and, you know, we, do we have to go to any effort or what, what, what's, it, what's involved, you know? So um, the, the, one of the most important aspects is actually getting out in the field. And that can vary from being up at Cradle Mountain where, the, where you're collecting butterflies at 12 degrees to being um, in tro the, the wet tropics or the Torres Strait in Queensland where you, you, the minimum temperature doesn't get below about 29 at night. So they're the sort of two environments, that, that the two extremes that you can work in. So now... Uh, uh, you'll notice the, the photograph on the left is uh, that's, uh, that's me in my younger, more plump days uh, uh, at the Daniel Boone, uh, the Daniel Boone um, State Forest in Kentucky. And uh, the specimens I collected on that trip there, I just brought up this time, I just brought up on this trip. The gentleman in the middle is actually from, uh, he was a friend, he's passed away now, but he was from Sicily. He... Uh, uh, we brought uh, him and his wife, they visited Australia in 2009, we brought them down to Tasmania. He had a ball collecting butterflies down here. He was just like Sicily, nice and cool. Uh, he, uh, he almost fell over in North Queensland. We took him to North Queensland. <laughs> he didn't do too well. <laughs> and the gentleman on the right, of course, is the, is the, the Ian Knight, and he, um, and he had the... Uh, ability to be able to work in both of those climatic regions without any trouble at all. Even at, even at the age of 86 was his last trip to the Torres Strait with me and he was still pretty good. So, uh, used to get, as he used to call, as he used to say, he used to be dripping. That was his famous saying, <laughs> I am dripping, <laughs> dripping wet, but he kept going. Okay, so what's involved? Look, yeah, of course, getting the specimen, getting the specimen in the net is the first thing. If if you're not rearing them through, as I said before, from the caterpillar stage or the young stage, getting them in the net, getting them down, sometimes from quite quite great heights. Uh, that's a relatively small piece of extension you see Ian, uh, Ian's got there, um, but you know we're, we've got extensions that, that go on three times that height, so. Uh, for, for getting up and high things, and sometimes they're even higher than that. We can't get them, so that's the that's the first thing you do is get get them in the net, and then the the next thing uh, it's involved is to um, yeah. So skill is required <laughs> to net the specimen, bring it home, and uh, and after after fifty odd years, you get um, you know fairly adept at it. So yeah, so I. And Ian, I think he probably had um, he had probably 60 years. I don't know something like that. So yeah, the, but basically getting them getting them in the net is the first thing. Now and then now uh, how you actually um, stun the specimen. Some people use um, uh, some people use um, 
different types of killing jars where they have solvents in the bottom of the killing jars or, and that, that normally stuns them. Then you put them in uh, little envelopes and, uh, and we used to, and it worked quite well, we used to just, uh, wherever we were staying, we would freeze the specimens then in little envelopes and label them with the dates and the location. You bring them home and then you, you set them or prepare them on special boards. And uh, that is an example of some, that's an example there of some, now these specimens here are from Timor. That's an example of how they're set. They're on these things called setting boards. And you put a, uh, a stainless, uh, a special stainless steel entomological pin through the thorax. You spread the wings delicately and then you have a very, very fine setting needle. You move the wings up without marking them. And then you put clear plastic strips uh, hang on. Clear plastic strips go over the wings uh, and they're pinned on a special polystyrene board and you can use cork boards or balsa uh, and then the, the abdomens are normally propped up with some pins as well and the antennae. So that's the setting process and, and it, it, you've got to really be, uh, to get it to that setting standard, it takes a while to perfect. As I as I was talking to David's father outside here, I, I started collecting when I was 10, but then I realised by, by the time I was 18, I realised that what I'd set was all trash. So I, I threw it all out and started again. And, uh, and some of the specimens are actually in the collection from that when I was 18. Some, there's some early specimens from that era. I won't say what year. <laughs> OK. And um, so then, look, properly... Properly set and label, uh, and David alluded to this, they have uh, an intrinsic extreme value because we can do a lot of things with that data. A specimen without a label underneath is uh, practically useless. You, you might, for scientific purposes, you might as well throw it out. It serves no purpose at all. Right, now... Australia. Now that is a sort of a rough, uh, my memory, I had to remember all the specimens, a lot of specimens had gone down to Tassie by the time I did this. I had to sort of roughly work out where we had been and now the, these areas over here are specimens that were, were provided for us, we didn't go there. These specimens up here are cicadas and beetles that came from that area. We had, um, our son-in-law was doing some work in that area. He was collecting insects while he was up there. Um, Ian, Ian went to the Northern Territory. Uh, we had some specimens from Alice Springs. And then uh, these ones through here, uh, uh, beetle specimens that my grandson has collected and, and donated to the museum. But all the others are all butterflies and uh, either either Ian, myself, or both of us together. Notice there's a high concentration in this area up here, Torres Strait, high concentration in the wet tropics, again, southeast Queensland, of course, where we both lived, where Ian lived for several years, and then a very strong presence down there in, in, uh, in Tasmania from Ian. And that's... Um, that's uh, and that is uh, Ian on Dwan Island in the Torres Strait, which is right up the top of the, uh, the strait. Everyone staying with it? Good. Okay. Then we move to, then we move to the other epicentre. We'll start with the epicentre. So this is to, this is the Torres Strait. If if you're not familiar with the Torres Strait, uh, this is uh, Papua New Guinea on the north, on the southern coastline of Papua New Guinea. Cape York is down there. This expanse here is about 150 kilometres. The water across that strait has uh, an average depth of 15 metres. It is very shallow. Most, a lot of it is coral reef. And then we have, we have various islands, and some of them are what we call terrestrial islands. They're like Australia. They have similar... They're made, out of, they, they're made up of granitic soil... Some on the east are volcanic, they're, they're basaltic soils. And then up the top we have uh, mud, mud islands, which are more or less extensions of this southern 
New Guinea coastline. And then in the middle, we have sandy coral caves. Now, all those circles illustrate all the islands that we've, we've been on in the Torres Strait. So that's where Ian and I have been to, but, but there's, there's a few more that we've been given, that I've, I've had um, donations given to me that have come down through QV Mag as well. So this formed, this study formed the basis, as um, David alluded to, my Master of uh, Philosophy, which I just finished in September. It was awarded. So, yeah, you can see that there's, there's this island here, which um, I haven't been to. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, 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 that's on the hit list. That's on the, 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 the next list. So then, then we go to the world, and as um, David alluded to, I had this habit of everywhere I used to go when I was younger and fitter, I used to um, you know, try to collect butterflies wherever I went. And these are the sort of epicentres... Oops, sorry. Hang on, go back. These are the sort of epicentres of where, where the collections were made. So, you've, you know, you've got the Australian ones. You've got um, Timor and... Uh, Floris, which I had the the um, the blessing to go there on several occasions, Sicily, there the island in the middle there, which my dear wife, she's Sicilian, she um, she was um, a uh, firstborn firstborn Australian from Sicilian parents, and we went back there several times, and uh, uh, Costa Rica on on that little on that little isthmus there, I was working there for um, for DPI. And then these um, American locations, I've done a bit of collecting there because our, our son actually lives in the USA, so that gave me the opportunity to do that. So now, and that over there is from Timor. It is uh, an endemic only found on Timor. It's a quite a large uh, black and gold butterfly called a Plato birdwing butterfly. Very, very attractive thing. Right, now, let's, let's move on to the groups now. Um, if, you, if you know very little about butterflies, I'll give you a crash course. Uh, this is uh, one of the families. It's the biggest and showiest group of the lot. Very popular with collectors. It's the Papillionidae or swallowtail butterflies. And uh, all, these, all these here... Oh, sorry, back, back. So press the wrong button. Hang on. Hang on. Yeah. Okay, these are all these are all Australian. Even the these big monstrous things over here, these are from the Torres Strait. These are Torres Strait, and of course, um, these are well known from the wet tropics, the Ulysses or Mountain Blue butterfly. And all these other ones are um, that these are just ones you get in Brisbane. Uh, they're quite common. And this one over here is actually quite an interesting one. It only, it's only found on Norfolk Island. So Ian went to Norfolk Island. Uh, I, th I think I needed to... On the Australian map, there was, also, there was also Christmas Island, Norfolk Island and Lord Howe Island, and they were, they were marked as well. So uh, Ian went to all three of those, collected on three. He was an island guy. He loved islands. So do, so do I. So, look, let's move on to the next one. And now, they were the Australian papillionids, but as, um, as David said, there's these satellite collections of, of other countries, which, um, ironically, we've, the collection basically covers all the regions of the world. It just happened that way. So, uh, so they these... Um, so these here are from um, Indonesia and Timor, and these ones here are from the Mediterranean. Yeah. So, um, and they're they're all they're all uh, they're all the papillionids, the swallowtail group. Now, uh, I don't know what David has of these, but I have it still at home 694 specimens of these. I don't know what you have. I don't know. Anyway, we'll get them. They'll get there. They'll get there. They'll get there. Okay, now let's move on to the next group, the Hesperides or the skipper butterflies. Um, and uh, now these are Australian. And they, they uh, you have some quite interesting ones here in Tasmania. 
Uh, they're they're a, a, a very, very strong southern group and, and tropical group. So the ones here in Tasmania are, a lot of them are endemics, they only occur in Tasmania, and um, David has all those at the moment. And uh, this, these ones are still at home. And, uh, and these ones here have blue labels, and I'm going to get on to that, why they have blue labels. I'll talk about that in a little while. But these ones here, to get the appreciation of the size of these, these are probably no more than, um, I would say, a centimetre across. So they're, they're tough nuts to prepare and set. Um, you've got to really, you have to really know what you're doing with them, otherwise you could... Ian was top-notch, top-notch setter, perfectionist, basically. Uh, he taught me a lot. And... Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, my standard picked up a lot after I met Ian. <laughs> so, and th this is a, a lovely, colourful thing we have in Queensland, and that's a skipper butterfly as well. So these are these are, are an interesting group in that they have a um, they they have some characteristics of moths, which um, uh, which makes them a bit of a funny group. This sort of a little bit moth, mainly butterfly, a little bit moth. So. Now, um, okay, so now these are, um, these ones are, uh, again, these are not, not Australian. These ones are from the Mediterranean. And this is some of the material, you know, they're pretty drab things, most of them. Um, but they're interesting. This is some of the material from the island of Floris. And, uh, and there's a few uh, new records in there which I'm, I'm going to publish on. And now we, now this is the staggering thing. Um, uh, I don't know how many David has, but we have, it's not a year, it's a number. 1975 of those still sitting in Brisbane. So they are still to come down, David. Yeah. Dave, David looks, don't know whether he's stunned or impressed. <laughs> worried, uh, he's worried about where to put them. Uh, we've got to, got to keep pushing that. Okay. Now, let's get on to the next group. So we're running through the different types of butterflies. And these are the Pierids, you know, predominantly yellow and white. So um, these, are, these are Australian. Uh, this is a, uh, these are the, uh, this group are from um, the Torres Strait Islands. They're all from the Torres Strait Islands. These are from the Queensland mainland. Um, these ones here are from Norfolk Island. And then we, um, we get on to what are called the, uh, the pearl whites, they're called. That's their common name. And you'll notice there's a few blue labels in there as well. So we're, we're still going to tell you about those. So there, there uh, but, but these, there are some, I just, for want of space, I just didn't have, uh, there are some quite spectacular ones of these. And I, I've been, um, I was looking for, uh, an image that was sort of more impressive looking in numbers rather than how exotic they looked anyway. But look, then we can go to exotic and we can actually go to, when you want exotic, you go to this lot over here, which are from Timor. They're endemic to Timor. And they are an absolute magnificent thing. They're probably one of the one of my favourite butterflies, they are gold, pure gold underneath and pure white. And these ones up here are the females. So the females and they're the males. Uh, and these are, these are this huge group here, the grass yellows, which are, um, uh, which are very difficult to identify, but I'm working on it. And these ones here, now this is, these are from the Mediterranean. And this one here, you only get in two locations in, in the Mediterranean. One is, one is um, uh, on the slopes of Mount Etna, and then they do occur in southern Italy, in Calabria. So they're an interesting one. So they're quite unique, those ones. And again, uh, if you look at the number, there's 1,664. Again, that's not a year, specimens of those. Now, let's move on. Now, we'll move on to one of the um, significant... We haven't got on to the final two uh, families yet, but we'll just digress a little bit 
and we'll get on to the one of the most significant collection is this group called the crow butterflies and um, for the for obvious reasons I like them <laughs> and I've published quite a number of manuscripts about about their taxonomy their to taxonomy or their na how you name them their names are very complex there's a lot not a, not a lot known about them and uh, the Torres Strait Island ones I've been rearing every species from egg to adult and I've been documenting the life histories and you have to really rear them through uh, because the, larv the, lar the larvae are different from each species, they all look different so you've got to get the larval stage to really to distinguish the closely related ones. So now these are all from, uh, this is from Murray Island in the far east of the strait and these two are from Dwan Island near the Papua New Guinea coastline. Now in addition to um, what's, there's, there's currently around 55 species worldwide um, but that you could probably expand that to about 100 once we finish working on them because they, they are just, I were, um, we were working in the museum yesterday, my wife and I, and we were working on these ones, and um, uh, they are a very complex group. And how many would you have, David, of the Euploia already? <laughs> uh, Simon, how many do you think? 300, maybe 300. 300, yeah, and then how many more, how many more to set? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this group, th this group came with, um, with the with the collection came. I should add that with the collection came two, two big collections from two deceased estates so that people I knew that their that their their widows actually gave me boxes of material in packets that weren't set, all labelled with the locations, but weren't set, and I just took them a decade or so ago, had no idea that QV Mag was on the horizon and gave them to Simon and he's um, setting material that goes back to at least 1970 and, uh, and it's coming up fantastic. So, and they're around, the, they are this group. So, now, they, they're distributed in the Oriental and Australian region, so they go from they go from about Madagascar through to some of the South Sea Asian South Sea Islands that not far from uh, not far from New Caledonia out that area. So they're very they're just in that little arc. And where the con the co co collection in um, That'll, that's coming down. It's coming down in bits and pieces. The crow collection. It it has about ten Australian species, and and or eleven, and most of those are in Torres Strait. That we don't have many on the mainland. So so far, I've published nine manuscripts, peer reviewed in peer reviewed journals, on this group uh, from the Torres Strait, with uh, with many more still to come. Now, and, the, and this is just a an indication of what they look like. Um, uh, the, these are exotic ones. These are from Indonesia, uh, Floris, and these ones are a mixture of Floris and Timor. But, um, yeah, we, I have... Um, have I said how many I have? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, David. I know. Uh, these ones, these ones are actually were from a, a, a very good friend of mine who passed away suddenly um, before his time about ten years ago, and he had two whole cabinets of he was he was uh, the Ploia man, and he had two whole cabinets plus a lot of material that Simon's been setting already, and he was going to work on them in his retirement, and unfortunately. He was only retired two years, and he he um, passed away suddenly, so he had no time. So his his um, his wife actually donated them to me. She said I could probably do some work with them. So I'm going to slowly work through those. And so they're all there. There's two cabinets of them. That that includes the 21 uh, 2106 includes the the 
the ones that were left, and it includes the Australian ones. But it does not include what Simon has said. Oh, yes, of course. I, I should have mentioned that. Is that on the next slide? No, it isn't. I'm glad you said that. Uh, this, that, that, that once that's all put together, that Euploia collection, that'll be the largest Euploia collection outside of the Natural History Museum in London of that group. Because we are, I mean, being in Australia, we're in a box seat. We're not, not far from all these places, you know. And so um, I have, um, from Florists alone, I have four life histories to describe and some taxonomic work to do on those groups. So that is still in the, in the, um, in the, in the plan to do. So look, so, but part of Euploia sit in this group called nymphalids, or the, or the nymph butterflies, and they, uh, they have some ex exotic looking things like leaf wings, you know, they have the leaf wings, blue, blue arguses, brown soldiers, they have these lovely names. And, uh, and these, uh, these ones here, these, one, uh, these blue ones, they're from Christmas Island, North Queensland, and then there's some through the Torres Strait and uh, Darwin there. But they now I think I have a number of those as well. I have a number. Oh, oh, sorry about that, David. I'll, I'll, I should have actually amended the number. So, now, now, now that these, uh, that these are some exotic material. Um, we were looking at identifying some of this yesterday at the museum. This, these, this group here. This, this is from um, uh, Floris and Timor. And this group here are from uh, the Mediterranean, actually. This thing, would you believe, is from Sicily. It's, the, it's a magnificent thing. So, so it's, um, they're sitting there. Um, I'm in the process of writing a, a paper about them at the moment, this whole Sicilian group. So, yeah, it's still, there's a lot of work still to be done. Now we're getting on to the last and probably the most diverse group in the world, are the small blue ones, the Lycenids, the Lycenidae. And this photo here doesn't give these guys justice. They are, they are tr they're all tropical. A lot of species, we have five, speci no, five species in the Torres Strait. Uh, we, have all the f we have all those five. And then we have these lovely things here with these long tails. They're tropical. Uh, wet tropics through to the Torres Strait, and all these are wet tropics things as well. So now, they are some of the most spectacular butterflies. Uh, even though they're small, they, they rival things like Ulysses butterflies. Uh, now, um, again, there's a, 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 sa a severe number there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they don't take us. Yeah, they don't take. Yeah, you can pack a lot in a drawer. Yeah, so th just to give you an idea, that the these ones here are from from Sicily, from the Mediterranean, and these ones here are a mixture of Timor and um, uh, and Floris. And again, a, a lot of these ma material that I've collected while I've been there have um, uh, are either new distributions or species that we don't know. So goodness knows what I'm going to do with them um, in, the, in the time I have. <laughs> so you might ask how, uh, you might, there's one question I haven't, haven't, that you're probably asking, why did I choose to go to Timor and Floris and collect butterflies? Have you asked that question? I wonder, I wonder why you take <laughs> Well, my wife and I, about 10 years ago, we started supporting a, a group of missions as lay missionaries and, and they had a brand new mission that they started in Florence and we went up there and we've been assisting them since then. They had another mission they started in Timor-Leste in 2016. So we spend a, a good deal of our time being helping, assisting those two missions and while I'm up there, the brothers up there take me butterfly collecting. Only half a day. Only half a day. <laughs> the rest of the time I'm busy, but um, last time they were actually walking around collecting butterflies for me. 
Uh, so that's, how, that's, the, that's the relationship anyway. So, yeah, I haven't been up there for a couple of years now with the borders closed, yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's 3,000-something. Now, so in total, uh, if you add up all those figures that I've quoted today, that's what's sitting at home. That's not including what I brought down this trip and what came down the previous one and what came down the previous, you know. There's been, I don't know, have I brought things down for on my three trips down here? I think I have. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. The, the hand luggage, they must have actually <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what it looks like at the, uh, on the x-ray machine, you know. A lot of, a lot of dots, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, that across those groups, um, yeah, that's what we're up to. We're, we're up to almost... Uh, almost 13,000 that are up there at the moment. And that was a rough count. That was a rough count. <laughs> okay, now we're getting on to the blue labels. Am I talking... i am been speaking too long. Uh, no, no. We'll get on to what the blue labels mean. Now, when, we, when a species is described, when it's been given a name... There is a certain number of specimens that are used to make that description, to develop that description. The, 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 male that you desi the male butterfly that is designated as the representative one is called a holotype. It has a red label. It must go into a museum. So the, the, the ones that you see here, the holotypes have all gone into the Queensland Museum. And it must go into the museum in the state that it was collected. So it must go in there. Now, the rest of the material that is used to, to look at, to look at the, the characters of, of the butterfly, characters of the insect, and that's used in the description, they're called paratypes. They can be either male or female. Now, what we have with, that are coming down to QV mag, and there are a couple of paratypes I've sent down already. I think there's, a, there's some cicadas and there's a, uh, a lysinid butterfly that's, that's down here already. So now we have um, uh, this one here, the, the paratypes we use, they're, they're coming down. Uh, and this is another species, of, not this one, that's a separate species. And these guys here are described from, uh, from the Northern Islands, the Torres Strait, they, that they're coming down. Now, this one's an interesting one because um, it, uh, that is, uh, the common name is Knight's Dart. And they were, those were discovered in the early 90s by Ian and Cindy Knight down in New South Wales. And they, the early 90s, and here we are, they discovered a brand new butterfly right under everyone's nose, just just north of uh, Port Macquarie. So uh, it was basically just on the side of the highway. And uh, and now those ones uh, that is called Ostibatistes nitorum. It bears the Aurum name because it's um, it was collected by two people bearing the same surname. So that made it Aurum, so uh, the first group. So that was Ian and Cindy, and that's why it was called Aurum was put on the end of the, the name. So we have uh, all the paratypes that I use for the description. I did the description. And, um, it, uh, and the actual butterfly is called Ostibatistes nitorum, night or night's dart. So they're... Uh, and they'll come down. They'll come down to... Um, they're not down here yet, but they will come down. And, and I have 62 paratypes up there at the moment. So paratypes are very... Uh, 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 good for a museum to have. They're very important pieces of data on them. So why do we keep the needles? Because the female might be quite different. Is that not right? Sorry? Um, so when you said that the needle has to go to the... Yes, yes. But not the female? No, not the female. No, no the, the male... The male is always designated as the holotype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of 
very good question. And and but the female, the, the females are, are are put under the paratypic name. Yeah. Hmm? Leukotype, is it? Leukotype. There's a there's a taxonomist over there. I'm I'm a, I'm a rudimentary taxonomist. You're not either. No. Leukotype. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dictionary. Yeah. But. But it's it's um, but so, sometimes uh, the, the sometimes there's a lot of paratypes because you've got a lot of material to work with. Other time other times you you only have um, half a dozen specimens to work with. So in the old days um, they used to a hundred or so years ago they used to actually uh, name uh, holotypes females and then it pre created a real problem later when, when the zoological rules were made and created a real problem with what specimen was the, was the holotype, you know. But some of them are labelled as holotypes, some of the early ones, but, but generally it's the male. Now, of special note is, in this collection, of special note, is this thing here you'll see and there's a lot of special notes about this collection, but this is just one of them. Um, th this thing here is just a small blue butterfly, and it has a, a dark brown-grey female. The males are blue, purpley blue. It lives in this environment here. It lives in mangrove communities, and it currently is only known from four islands in the Torres Strait. So I named it in 2005, Lit Litoralis, which means the littoral zone or the mangrove zone, coastal zone. Now, those are only on four islands and they basically live at sea level. And with rising sea levels due to climate change, they are in trouble. So, now, we have a... We have a Good number of species. Have I sent some of those down already? I think I have. Yes, I have. I have. And we have a we have a good representation of them. We have the paratypes, so they're a good they're a really good basis to know you know where where they occurred, and when they occurred, in case in future we, we lose them. So, but but I'm going to get onto that in a little bit. So. Once we now I'm talking now we're looking at the scientific value of collections and uh, if you'll notice there's a label there um, I know Simon Fern's labels are a lot bigger than this but but this one this one's just an example of um, of these guys here these lovely owl butterflies which you get in the Torres Strait they're a New Guinea thing that only come down in the Torres Strait. And there is, I think, a drawer of them in, at, over at QV Mag. There's a drawer of these. So, you know, just as an example, it, it, it lists uh, on the label under the, uh, under the specimen list to Iron Island, Torres Strait, Queensland, it gives the decimal um, coordinates. And it gi gives information like X captive female, I got a female to lay some eggs. When I collected the female, when it laid the egg, when it emerged as an adult, and then who did it. So with that information, not only do you have temporal data, you have time data, you have lo location data, and you have collector load up data. Because in, in years to come, uh, when, you, when you look at a label on a, on a specimen, insect specimen, and you look at the collector, you can gauge how bona fide the specimen is by who collected it. And if, the, if there is no name on it and it's an odd one, out you start scratching your head a little bit and saying, well, I don't know where this came from. Did it really come from there? But if it had someone like who, who was sort of renowned, you know, like Ian Knight or myself or there's a lot of others, uh, you can sort of gauge that, yes, look, that, that specimen did come from there and that is a true, true record. So let's keep moving. Almost there. Yeah, so labelling the specimen is the utmost important. So without the label, as I alluded to before, without the labels, the collection is useless. 
Okay. Now, and it says, well, uh, and I think David might have alluded to this, properly labelled specimens are like time capsules, you know, of what... Uh, and they can be used for present and future conservation measures. So what, what, we, what we know about an animal by what's on that label, by having that specimen. And um, things that you cannot do with a photograph. If we needed to... If we needed to uh, uh, do some genetic material on this butterfly, we cannot do genetic material on a photograph. If we need to look at the genitalia of the male and female structures, we can't, um, photographs don't have genitalia. So basically, it is of immense value. Okay. Now, so with uh, their knowledge storehouses, so. Um, Basically, if we want to conserve something, we have to know what we have. And without knowing what we have, we don't know what's out there. So having specimens in a drawer, in a collection, well labelled, well preserved, we know we can document them and we have a lot of knowledge. This one, by the way, is a... Um, this one here, the specimens haven't come down yet, but that um, is the Australian fritillary butterfly. It's... Uh, it's likely extinct and there'll be specimens of those coming down here. Hasn't been seen, hasn't been seen for uh, about 25 years, so uh, it's, they're beginning to have grave doubts, uh, grave fears about it, its existence. So then, then it uh, really relates to, then, then it, it goes further into that, that museums are storehouses for information generated by, you know, every, everyone that studies the natural world and puts specimens in a museum. Um, and then they, they, actually, they actually form the largest source of information on Earth's biological diversity collections. And it's most of what we know about, most of what we know about specimens, as I alluded to in early in the talk, is from specimens, what we know about species. If we didn't have these species, if we didn't have these species in the Natural History Museum in London or any museum, we would know very little about these animals, and very little about how to preserve them or conserve them. So, uh, an outcome, one of many, um, using the butterfly collection data from the Torres Strait. Um, that's just an example of a manuscript I did on the on a on a crow butterfly. I did a taxonomic revision of that that group. And this is just the front page of my thesis that I just was awarded, where it looked at the, the butterfly fauna in the Torres Strait. So that, that's... Um, um, so we, we've been able to, I've been able to document the, the butterfly fauna of this remote region. 25 manuscripts have come out of, um, out of butterfly... The, 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 but, uh, the collecting we've done in the wet tropics and the Torres Strait. Um, so, yeah, so we can develop a, a, a really good idea, and that uh, that thesis does do that. It just get, gets this sort of relationship between islands and mainlands. It's extended our knowledge of that by using flagship species like butterflies as our as our example. Uh, where are we now? Um, and we can make predictions. Of you know, and based on butterfly, uh, based on what we know about butterflies, we can make predictions of where we might find particular species, and if they're not there, why aren't they there? And uh, yeah, so that and and we've I've been able to determine through this study, um, you know, how how butterflies move around, which is a, an important thing. And then we can look at incoming pest species, and that's a little bit like Tasmania here, where you're an island and you're looking at incoming pests. And lastly, um, yes, yeah, so basically we, we're offering a baseline that we can develop up from that point on uh, when, when things start going bad with... Um, Hopefully they won't, but with climate change and the effect it has, it's going to have on particularly cool climate things like this. Low, lowland areas in the tropics, cool climate things here. 
Cool climate mountaintops in the tropics are at risk too. Okay, so finally, the threats and conservation. Yeah, I've alluded to before baselines. We, we, but we have baselines for climatic change impacts. And rising sea levels, um, in, particularly in the Torres Strait, from, a lot of it's from thermal heating. Um, water molecules take up more space when they're warmer than they're cooler. Um, and the temperature is warming, as... Um, David has told me several times about Tasmania here. And uh, look, look, weed management is, is always a problem. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Tasmania here, but Brisbane, uh, South East Queensland and um, the Torres Strait as well, uh, managing weeds is, is a real issue. What's happened? Oh, yeah. And, uh, of course, once those invasive weeds and grasses come in, invasive grasses burn hotter. So when there's fires, they burn hotter and they destroy much, much more than what, say, if a native grass burnt. And um, finally, deforestation is a, is a key problem with all sorts of animals in the world. And, um, and particularly in Queensland, we have, um, and probably here as well, um, our wetland environments are particularly at risk. And, uh, and uh, most environments are, but in Queensland it's our wetland environments. They've suffered very badly through the deforestation. And on that note, I thank you. And that's it. <laughs> so, um, um, I, I'm sorry I went... I, I didn't think it was going to go that long, but it just did. I'm sorry. As long as every, as long as everyone was interested. Any questions, please? Yes. Excuse my uh, extremely stupid question, but why are butterflies called butterflies? Uh, okay, okay. There's a theory about that. Uh, in um, in merry old England, um, there was a there, there was a thing called a, a butterfly called a, a brim. A, a brimstone butterfly, which was predominantly yellow, and the colloquial name became butterfly because it was butter colour. So that's where it came from. Mm. So it's yep, yep. How can you tell the difference between a male and a female butterfly? Is there anything that um, stands out to show that they are different sexes? Uh, uh, okay, butterflies are. Um, uh, Many butterflies, the males look nothing like the females and vice versa, many species. And, and those particular species, for many years, for many of those species, um, the, early, the early taxonomists sep uh, named them different species until they found out that, that out of one crop of caterpillars you get both types come out. Now that's, that's, that's the ones that are quite different. And, um, but... Some of them are quite uh, are very similar and quite often, of course, they, the, the abdomens, if you look at the, um, the abdomens of a female butterfly, it tends to be a bit stockier because it has to have eggs and, um, and the males have thinner abdomens. Uh, may, uh, sometimes the, the, the female butterflies have more rounded wings, have less sharp wings, which the males have. There's little subtle differences like that. Um, how specialised are they on things that they eat? So if, if they're in an area where invasive weeds come in and it kind of gets rid of some native flowers, can they turn to other flowers or um, is that a real...? Well, um, the, 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 nectar source, the nectar sources of the adults, you know, what the adults, what flowers they go to, is important, but f far, far more important is the actual plant that the, the caterpillar of the butterfly feeds on. So, uh, in fact, um, in Tasmania here, uh, you, to increase butterflies, you would need to start planting native plants, and that would increase. For example, in, um, in southern Queensland, uh, we, as I said, our, our, our weed invasion is... It's, we don't have a good history with weed invasion. 
And what, happened, what has happened in, in southern Queensland, in the open forest country, uh, ground cover weeds have come in, smothered out, outcompeted the native, the native ground covers, the native ground plants, which a lot of the butterflies fed on. Now, those butterflies have just disappeared from those environments. So, yeah, that's what I mean by weed invasion. It's, it's the, ones that feed on, the ones that feed on, the butterflies that feed on trees, their larvae feed on tree, plant leaves of trees, they're not as hard hit as the ones that feed on the ground, the ground dwelling ground growing plants, yeah. Yeah. When you've got the drawer, um, and I know not anything about butterflies, yeah. yep. but I can see that there's very small differences between, say, number one here down to number six. So you've mm. got a whole drawer of them. How do you pick which ones to put in there and how different is number one from number two down through to number oh, six? Oh, well, what, yeah, what, um, what you're probably looking at are, are very uh, are different species. That's, that's because there shouldn't be a whole drawer of one species. No, if, if, you, uh, if you look at those drawers at the back, I, I don't know what they are, I haven't looked at them yet, but, but um, uh, normally you would only, there might only be six or eight of each species there. And, and remember, some, some of the specimens are prepared or set upside down. So some of them you'll see the underside pattern and the others you'll see the topside pattern. So, yeah. Yeah, when you... Quite often, particularly those blue, that bl those blue groups, you know, where they're all blue, they look quite, look quite similar, but they, they're different species, yeah. And, and you can only... My, and quite often, you cannot make an identification on the wing or from a photograph. You actually have to have a specimen. Mm. So, sorry, just to add to that, uh, just prior to the lecture starting, I was in the collections trying to work out just how many he sent down. Uh, and it looks like in each species block, there's between one and uh, usually 18 would be the maximum number. There, are, there is one group of 30. But the thing is, within that block, everyone's a unique animal and everyone has slightly different characteristics. And that, so that, having that block of animals allows people like Trevor to describe that's the variation within that species. So we, we call those a series. We always have mm. a series. And, and each one of those specimens has a, a genetic code, each one. It's individual genetic makeup. <laughs> yes, I was going to ask. Um, Ian's given me some of his failures in setting. Um, and failures? Oh, no. You know, ones that weren't perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. For instance, Maclay's swallowtail, the variation in markings is quite noticeable between the different specimens. Yeah. And it's quite fascinating, really. You know, the colour variation, the spot variation, the yes, catch yes, variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, some 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 butterfly species are 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 variable, are quite variable. Others are stock standard. Mm. Um, you just you just yeah, you know, they have their I won't say they have their own um, personality, but <laughs> that's what I was asked recently. Do they have personalities? But um, they no they they're quite um, yeah, some some are highly variable of which um, uh, David was saying that you know that those ones you really need to have a larger series. If they're not variable, you don't have to have a, as much a series. But Maclay swallowtails, they do. In fact, they Maclay swallowtails, they um, they were an example of um, people in the early days. People were collecting, you know, one from this location and another one from that location, saying, "Oh, they're different. We'll give them different names." And then not realising if they had collected more of them and more of them, they would have all blended together, you know, with their patterning. Mm. Trevor, the collection is made up of those uh, groups from Australia, which we can see the benefit directly to our mm. studies. But also all those satellite collections from other countries. Um, this is a leading question. Okay, yeah. uh, Good. What's the use of them being given to little old Launceston? For instance, what, Sicily or Puerto mm. Rico? Uh, Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah. How, so how are they going to find out we've got them and use them? 
How are they going to, how are they going to find out? You? Well, once they're on the web, of course, all the data, they'll get to it. Yes, That's they will. Yeah. They will. But even for Australians, even for students, the butterflies in each region in the world have their own specific groups that they're strongest in. There are a couple of groups in the Central American area that you virtually don't get anywhere else. There's groups here in Australia that don't occur anywhere else. There's groups in Floris that don't occur anywhere else. And Europe's the same. When you're studying biogeography or zoogeography, if you want to go uh, just animal zoogeography, um, particularly for students doing, doing all sorts of zoology, it's, it's a very good learning tool to have a, I mean, because, you know, if, you, if you're studying, for example, um, mimicry, for example, uh, let, let's talk about Morellian and Batesian mimicry, of which there are a couple of theories that, there are a couple of theories that, um, uh, particularly in butterflies, that if you have a bright pattern and you're poisonous, another species becomes brightly patterned that's not poisonous. So th that one, that, that's um, uh, Batesian mimicry. Then, then you have other ones that, that um, theoretically, this is all theory of course, join in on it and, that, and neither of them are brightly patterned and they're, they're Morellian mimicry. Now, that occurs strongly in Central America and South America, no, not so much anywhere else. But that in itself, I, I went to university and I learned about those mimicries and I would have loved to have had some specimens to look at. So they are there for whoever, whatever university student wants to look at them, look at the data, look at photographs or look at the specimens themselves. There's some classic examples there. I can ask a question now. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for stealing, stealing the floor. Um, first of all, excellent presentation. Really, really Thank good. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for um, uh, presenting today. Uh, my question was a little cheeky one. When you sit down to pin, how long does it take you to do one butterfly? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you now. Uh, Ian Knight used to take. He 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 was absolutely fast. He was more fastidious than I was in in setting. I'll be honest. He used to take fifteen minutes for each one. But. Um, but ironically, the larger ones take a lot less time than the smaller ones. So, yeah, look, um, those little ones I was telling you about before, Ostibatistes nitorum, I mean, they are, they are very difficult to set because they're tiny and they're very stiff muscles in the wings. Yeah, you'd be, even for myself, I'd be looking at probably 15 minutes to set each one of those. And then you've got to... After they're dry, you have to actually peel the, the plastic off and then take them out then, and then type up location labels, pin them underneath and then curate them and put them in the drawer in the right spot. And, so, and then, plus you've had to have collected them as well. So, you know, eh, all that Simon Fern can it te attest to this, yeah, take... Yeah, it, um, yeah, but um, but the good look. I, I want to just finally wrap it up by saying that you know we Ian Ian was a, a, a great mentor to me. He, I met him when he when I was only in my in my early twenties. Um, he was a great mentor to me. He he taught me how to do things properly, and I kept that going. And then to get to this stage of life with the collection and have QV Mag um, so excited and dedicated to take on the collection, look after it and have it for generations to come. Um, it, it's just, um, I think it's just overwhelming uh, to be in that position. I never dreamed this would happen because um, I can tell you now that many museums, when you ask about, look, I have a butterfly collection and it's sort of like, don't call us, we'll call you. That's the attitude. Because they don't have time, don't have space, don't have money. And um, to have a, a, 
a museum that is so enthralled with getting the collection and looking after it so well, that's just, that's, that's, that, that's really a blessing to, to both Ian and I for, to be in that position. And I thank the QV Mag for that. Okay, and I'm done. <laughs> Trevor, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you so very much for a fascinating presentation. There's nothing like hearing from an expert, is there? Um, your talk has really changed, I think, everyone's perception of this collection, whether it's describing how it was built, the detail that goes into pinning them, the study, the travel, the diversity and the many hours, let alone the expertise you've built up over, the, over your career. I think it's an amazing achievement and um, a testament to both you and Ian that uh, the butterfly passion that you both shared as um, a professional and as a, a passionate uh, amateur with Ian, to have built up a collection like this is absolutely extraordinary. And I don't think anyone here today is going to be able to look at that uh, collection uh, and not see it with new eyes. Thank you so much for sharing your, your passion. You so and I, I want to say that we're very committed to um, looking after this collection and making the most of it. And it, having heard this, I think uh, hopefully we're all motivated to really work hard to support the museum in its fundraising efforts to make sure that this collection lasts for generations to come and that we can make the most of it. It's got an extraordinary potential to in, fire up people's imagination about what are extraordinary insects, but also to teach us a lot about our world. On your seats today is the, the donation and fundraising information, I'd encourage you all to think about who you might know that might be able to actually help us to raise the significant amount of funds. And by the way, it seems like those, those funds need to rise a little bit to cater for a wonderful <laughs> yeah, new I'm collection. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not complaining, we're not complaining. But I think Launceston is great in, in using its networks to support what we're trying to achieve, and you understand now just why we really need to work hard to do that. Thank you so much for coming. We have afternoon tea outside, so if you'd like to talk a little bit more to, to Trevor or his family or to Cindy, um, you're very welcome to stay, and I'm sure you've got plenty to talk to each other about. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.